ta fotio roi vis jakig ores un uktron, in vil koni eg uktron na heru. This house has been at the center of Irish life for more than two centuries. In modern times, eight Irish presidents have lived in this house, which has attracted distinguished visitors from all over the world. Some of them amongst the most important and influential figures of this century. Like you, they came to visit Oris Anuptaron, the official residence of the President of Ireland. The story of this house begins in the 17th century, a period in Irish history of colonization and plantation. In 1660, the Phoenix Park, an area of 1,752 acres, was designed as a walled deer park by the first Duke of Ormond. In 1751, Nathaniel Clemens was appointed Chief Ranger of the Phoenix Park and Master of the Game. And though he was also an amateur architect, it is known that he engaged at least one other architect, John Wood of Bath, to produce plans for the design of the house. There have been many changes and improvements since then, but much of the original design can be identified today. In 1782, the house was sold for the handsome price of £25,000. It was bought by the British government and became the official residence of the Viceroy, the Crown's representative in Ireland. The Viceroy was a man of real influence with considerable powers of patronage. After all, he had a direct line to either King or Queen. With the arrival of the Viceroy in the park, the life of the house was to change forever. Many of the viceroys entertained lavishly. There were dinners and balls where the elite of the ascendancy gathered. An invitation to such occasions was a sure sign of one's status and position in society. Dublin at the time was a thriving centre of commerce and culture. For those with money, it was a splendid place to live. The cost of living was low, servants plentiful, and the income from tenants on country estates ensured a life of ease. Grand streets and squares grew up in and around the capital. The ascendancy was building as never before. Some say to convince themselves that not only had they arrived, but also that they would remain. Perhaps the culmination of this Georgian period of building was Gandon's Four Courts and Custom House. Meanwhile, back in the park, it wasn't long before the Viceroy decided that his own house needed improvement. In 1805, Francis Johnston became architect and inspector of civil buildings. He transformed the original design with the addition of wings and the south portico. Clearly, Johnston's work on the house was highly regarded. The Viceroys were well pleased, describing the improved design as resembling a residency or government house somewhere in the colonies. It could have been in the Indies, Canada, or indeed Australia. In the 1840s, the grounds were wonderfully improved with gardens designed by Decimus Burton. During the same period, the architect Jacob Owen carried out a major program of works. The east wing of the house was extended and a coach house was built. While the Viceroy carried on with his functions of state, behind the scenes, life carried on equally busily. There were maids and butlers cooks and pastry chefs. In the stables, grooms, footmen and farriers cared for the horses. A permanent regiment of soldiers was billeted in the wings.
1849 was an important year for the house. Queen Victoria announced a state visit, and in preparation for this, a new dining room and official reception room were added. By all accounts, she thoroughly enjoyed her visit, describing the view of the mountains as very beautiful. Three years later, a much less publicised, though important connection was made to the house. The Dublin mains gas supply made its way through the park to the Viceregal Lodge. In 1876, the Duke of Marlborough became Viceroy and he brought with him his son to act as secretary. The new secretary was Winston Churchill's father and the young Winston visited his father at the Viceregal Lodge. Outside the gates of the house, the curve of history continued and successive viceroys reported back on developments in Ireland. They sent dispatches on famines, insurrections, the Act of Union that removed the Parliament from Dublin, Catholic emancipation and the land wars. In 1907, King Edward VII visited Ireland and stayed at the house. Had he arrived a year later, he would have enjoyed the convenience of the electric light which was connected that year. Three years later, with the announcement of the visit of King George V, a further extension of the West Wing was completed. But within ten years, Life inside and outside this house would change utterly. On the streets of Dublin, labour unrest was increasing, culminating in the great dispute and lockout of 1913. In Europe, the First World War broke out, and as millions died, the frontiers and dynasties of Europe would change forever. Near her home, in Dublin's Sackville Street, on Easter Sunday 1916, the sound of gunfire was heard from the city centre. The end of the vice-regal years was at hand. Within six years, the Irish Free State was formed, and the last Viceroy, Viscount Fitzalan of Derwent, departed from office. For the next 14 years, the House had a new role as official residence of the Governor-General, a post which was created to represent the interest of the Crown in the Irish Free State. With the framing of the 1937 Irish Constitution, the post of Governor-General was abolished. A new position was created, Uachtaran Naherin, President of Ireland. Since then, this house has remained the official residence of the President of Ireland. A place where you are welcome today. Oris on Uachtaran, the home of the President. We invite you to explore the rest of the exhibition area and the house, and we hope you enjoy your time here. Togamid kuraii fiakin teran guidela den tas pontes, agus tas sulguin gomanik shiftanov as vurguidama anshah.